And as the years went by, he, had, he gave up alcohol. Uh, but he, was, he belonged to a sect, the Amidai, uh, I think that's what it's called, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, that has been officially declared heretic in Pakistan, his home country. And as a result, for many years, he wasn't allowed back into Pakistan. Uh, but he was quite religious about that. I mean, uh, you know, I regard all religion with a certain sense of bemusement, and the Amidai sect seemed even a little bit more peculiar than the other branches of Islam, but uh, he was quite serious about it. He had two wives, uh, one of whom uh, an Oxford don. I know her, yes. And the other is a very conventional uh, Pakistani woman who lives in London. And they both came to the Nobel Prize uh, in 1979, and they alternated uh, appearances at the, uh, <laughs> at the official events. Uh, he, uh, it's in interesting, because although he was quite devout as a Muslim, he deplored the anti-scientific attitude that he found in the world of yes. Islam. He, he told me that he had tried to get the, the states of the Persian Gulf, the, which are very oil-rich, like Dubai and, and so on, um, Bahrain. Uh, he tried to get them uh, to put money into building universities that would uh, include a, a component of basic science. And he said that they were very resistant to that, that they wanted to go into technology, they were enthusiastic mm -hmm. about technology, but they, they, they did not want to do fundamental science with it, because they thought that was um, corrosive to religious belief. Probably rightly so. Yes, I, yeah. I suspect they're but right. But he didn't think that then, he didn't think it was no, corrosive. No, no, no. His point of view was that of many well-meaning physicists uh, I know in America who think, oh, there's no problem, you, science, religion can happily coexist. Yes. I think, in fact, um, uh, although it's a slow process and there are many exceptions, that in the long run, uh, science is eating the lunch of religion. Yeah, I think so too. And that uh, we already have seen a great weakening of, of religious belief. Uh, it's obvious in Europe I think it's also true in America. I, th I think Americans believe in religion, I mean, on the average. They believe that religion is good for you. And um, they, uh, but, but when you ask them what do they actually believe about the afterlife or about how, do you, how are you saved, they're likely to tell you, no, well, it isn't so important what you believe. The important thing is to good, live a good life. Yes. I've yeah. heard that so many yeah, times. Me too. Yeah. So I think the, um, the, you know, if I really cared about religion, and I looked at the state of religion in America, I think I would cry over it. it it's, religion is a mile wide and an inch deep. It, it yeah. doesn't go very far. It doesn't make me cry, it makes me laugh, but we, yeah. we, we're running out of time. Um, so can, can we resume after? I began by saying I felt humble as a biologist, and one of the reasons is the sheer mysteriousness of physics, which I suppose is nowhere more true than in fundamental particle physics. Uh, and, but as a biologist, I, I try to come to terms with why it's so hard to understand, and I, I'm wondering what you think of this, that something about, um, well, natural selection equipped our brains to uh, control medium-sized bodies, which is moving at medium speeds mm -hmm. um, in roughly two dimensions rather than, well, in three, three dimensions. Um, and therefore, things like multidimensionality, things like um, particles mysteriously going through two slits or one, depending upon when anybody's looking at them, uh, and um, the, the slightly less mysterious aspects of, of relativity. Our brains were never equipped to understand that kind of thing because we didn't need to. But if we had, had been denizens of interstellar space traveling at near the speed of light, relatively would be second nature to us. And if we had been uh, the size of fundamental particles, we wouldn't find mysterious hmm. the things that, that I at least find mysterious. Do you find them mysterious or, or, or do you cope with them in, in your own mind? I think you're exactly right about why they seem mysterious. Uh, we cope with them uh, using mathematics. And we, um, 
have mathematical formulations of quantum mechanics that are perfectly satisfactory. We know how to calculate things. Uh, uh, a course in physics is a series of problems. The student has to learn how to s calculate the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, the, the, the classic problem that um, convinced people that they were on the right track during the development of quantum mechanics. Uh, occasionally, perhaps, we lose our sense of strangeness because the mathematics becomes so familiar to us. Uh, I think there are things that are uh, truly strange and that uh, even though we can deal with them mathematically, it, we shouldn't lose the sense of strangeness. Not relativity, uh, which no longer <laughs> seems to me uh, paradoxical or weird. But uh, quantum mechanics is really strange. Uh, the, in, the, the interpretation of quantum mechanics that developed in the early 1930s uh, under the leadership of Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, the Copenhagen interpretation, I think is fundamentally flawed. It, it divides the world into physical systems and observers. Yeah. And uh, that can't be right. Observers are parts of the world. They yes. have to be described yes. by the same quantum mechanical language as everything else. Uh, the, the first person who uh, thought seriously about that and tried to develop an alternative way of looking at quantum mechanics was a graduate student at Princeton, uh, Everett. Uh, Hugh Everett. Hugh Everett. Yeah. And, but his solution to the problem uh, is in a way even weirder. Uh, there, there is something called the wave function which evolves in a completely deterministic way and it, there is a wave function of the universe which governs everything including all our observers and their apparatus and the physics journals in which they publish their results. And uh, all of that, all that happens during a measurement and a pub subsequent publication is all described in the evolution of the wave function, but if you have, to, if you believe that, then you really have to believe that uh, since in an experiment uh, we can have a, a particle which has neither a definite spin this way or this way, but is a superposition of the two, when the spin is measured, it's either this way or this way, one or the other, with different probabilities, in, you, Everett's, in, in Everett's interpretation, both are realized. The universe splits into a world in which the electron is spinning this way and the observer sees it spinning this way, and another world where it's spinning this way and the observer spinning, sees it spinning that way. And this happens not only in physics buildings, but continually throughout the universe, so that uh, the wave function of the universe is infinitely more complicated than we normally think of the universe itself as being. It contains components for every possible history uh, of, of the things in it. Now that's so weird that uh, you know, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to think in those yeah. terms. It seems to me to be ever so slightly less weird than the Copenhagen interpretation. Well, I, I, it, it's less weird in the sense that... It's just hideously uneconomical. I yeah. Think. Well, I would say the Copenhagen interpretation is just hopeless because I, the split between observers and, mm. and... Observers can't be different from electrons and yeah. spins 